Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, and also, actually, I want to thank uh, Liana and uh, Giovanni for keeping this uh, webinar going and for the opportunity um, to present today in my work, our work uh, this morning. Um, as you may know, my lab is interested in understanding um, how pathogens, bacteria, and viruses uh, use host metabolic pathways, uh, mostly host lipids, uh, uh, during infection. Today, I'm going to tell you uh, a story that we started um, a few years ago when I started uh, my lab uh, at Oregon Health and Science University. And that is how flaviviruses uh, use the host lipids during infection. Um, Flaviviruses are emerging and are emerging viruses, and they uh, belong to the family Flaviviridae. Um, uh, these viruses got uh, their name uh, from one of their oldest member, that's the yellow fever virus. Uh, that is because the word flavus in, in, in Latin means um, I, I yellow, because the disease actually causes yellow. Uh, uh, Jean Do and patients. So uh, it actually not the, 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 this flavi virus encompasses several vi other viruses as well, including dengue, Japanese uh, and encephalitis, West Nile, uh, and also Zika virus. They mostly transmitted by mosquito and also um, tick. Um, they cause uh, fever, encephalitis, and other. Um, uh, symptoms. And this viruses, uh, I think from, from a virology point of view, they are a single-stranded enveloped RNA viruses. They are relatively small. Um, they, and their shape is uh, symmetric, and I will talk more about their uh, uh, life cycle uh, as we go on. But I think um, it is really uh, um, given the current pandemic, I think it is important to give some sort of historic perspective and the significance of these uh, viruses uh, uh, in, as a whole. Um, they are historically very, very important viruses, and especially that of yellow fever virus, because back in the days, it causes a lot of uh, epidemics and then they killed uh, thousands and thousands of people um, I'm going to give you a few examples of those epidemics. One, in the most, I think the most important one was the epidemic in Philadelphia in 1793. At the time, Philadelphia uh, was the nation's largest city uh, and its capital, home to prominent um, citizens like um, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and uh, at the time, the, 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 this uh, yellow fever virus killed more than 10% of the population of Philadelphia. And uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush uh, was the one, the top infectious doctor at the time, was giving advice to the president, pretty much like the current um, a day of uh, Dr. Tony Fauci, um, uh, that gives um, really advice to the uh, current president. So, uh, in a way, it is, you know, uh, it it's, it's reminds us of uh, that. And, and, and I think um, in many ways, it it's, it's mirrors the current pandemic. Uh, one of the historians, Matthew Carey, wrote in, in one of his books the following. Uh, Close friends avoided each other in the street. In some households, family members were banished into the street when they complained of a headache a common precursor to yellow fever. Parents desert their children as soon as they are infected. And in every room you enter, you see no person but a solitary black man or woman uh, near the sick. The, 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 the irony, the, 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 the saddest part is that at the time, African-Americans were falsely told that they were immune to yellow fever. So but they, they, they died uh, quite a lot, just like the current uh, COVID-19 cases. Uh, and, then, and then after that, there was, 
you know, a lot of epidemics of that kind. And the most, uh, the other most prominent, prominent one was the Mississippi Valley epidemic uh, that um, spread along the Mississippi River and Memphis was the most highly uh, affected. Uh, but then there was huge interest and then and obviously uh, some key breakthroughs uh, at the time. It took them a couple of hundreds actually to come up with, with really key uh, breakthroughs. The first one was uh, by uh, Carlos Finley. This is a Cuban uh, who was doing research, mosquito research in Gen uh, Havana, uh, who proposed at the time that uh, yellow fever was a uh, mosquito-borne virus, but then it took around uh, 20, 30 um, years to be really experimentally confirmed by uh, just in the Walter Reed. Um, and then they isolated the virus in the 20s and 30s, and the vaccine was developed by Max Steele, a South African um, uh, infectious disease doctor who was working in uh, Rockefeller at the time. And, uh, and then he got a Nobel Prize uh, for his work. Uh, that is a bit of history. Uh, and and then, then, then still, the, the, the interesting part is this uh, viruses are actually very important uh, today. 25% uh, 20, of the world population is at risk. Um, when you just take you know, all flaviviruses that include Zika, yellow fever, dengue, uh, Japanese inflators, West Nile, all together they infect about 400 million human, uh, humans uh, each year. So it is really important. And today I'm going to tell a little bit about Zika virus and our work related to this virus. Um, it's actually, you know, even though recently in, in, in the 2015, 2016, when WHO declared the outbreak, uh, public health emergency. It was actually discovered a while ago in, 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 in the 40s and, uh, and, uh, and then again re-emerged in recently a few years ago, which actually caused my, took, uh, you know, way, way, at, th at that time I was just starting my lab. So um, I thought this is worth doing this, this study. Here is a life cycle of uh, flaviviruses in, the, in general. They enter um, host through receptor mediated endocytosis. Uh, they get into endosomes, fuse with the membrane, the, the, the envelope of this virus fuse the membrane with the membrane uh, because of the acidic uh, uh, environment in endosomes. Then that makes them release into the, uh, the, the, their RNA into the cytosol. Um, they get at, uh, the, the RNA get in, translated in, in, in the ER, they um, replicate in the ER, and they also actually they assemble in the endoplasmic reticulum. The interesting part is that in the endoplasmic reticulum, they form these replication factories that bud off from the ER and forms really the sort of vesicles. And once they are assembled, they mature through the secretory pathway, they get modified in the Golgi, by different um, uh, uh, enzymes, um, uh, and, and, and then they, they, they exit. So if you just, uh, if you look at this uh, cellular um, um, processes, they are actually pretty much like the normal um, uh, cellular processes, right? The most fascinating aspect is that the life cycle of this viruses follows normal host cellular processes for entry, replication, egress, trafficking. They basically use the host factor, the host cellular processes. So that means during their uh, long lasting coexistence uh, with their host, uh, microbial pathogens, including these viruses, have evolved with a variety of strategy um, to enter traffic and the propagate. That is actually the really the fascinating part, I think, uh, for us. Uh, so uh, knowing this, I think the different cellular processes uh, uh, in, in the life cycle of these viruses is very, very important to design a strategy to combat um, uh, diseases caused by these uh, viruses. So, um, uh, 
the first set of experiments that we actually did was uh, doing um, e, um, um, this was just to examine what happened uh, during infection, which was it was actually very very stark. Um, so what's happening is if you infect host cells with the Zika virus, it, it enters and it forms this replication factory. So let me. Uh, So if you look at the, this, this replication uh, uh, site where the virus actually forms this, this membrane vesiculation and the membrane alteration, you see that lipids in one way or in another are critical uh, for viruses. Um, and uh, and, and then most of them are actually bed off from the ER. Um, and, uh, and then because of this, uh, we thought to uh, look into uh, the role of lipids um, in, in, in Zika virus in, uh, infection. So we then looked at, we, we went to look at the, you know, from, from, from uh, unbiased point of view, in, 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 a, in a way just to look at the global uh, lipid profiling of Zika virus infected um, human cells. So we infected the cells, uh, and we waited, you know, different time point. We had vested, we basically performed uh, global uh, lipid profiling um, and uh, examined the change that are occurred in infected as compared to uh, uninfected cells. What we find is, uh, this is the PECA of that data. And then, and as you can see, there is a very clear uh, segregation of infected versus uninfected cells uh, showing um, uh, this virus altered the host lipids uh, during infection. Um, to look at and the you know the different lipid species that are changed uh, in, in in virus infected cells, uh, we we this is just to show the um, uh, um, the change that occurred on these lipids. This is uh, the, the, the different uh, lipid species are color coded. And this is the log uh, fold chain. And um, as you can see, it's basically uh, the, the infected cells causes global lipid chain. It's not really specific. There some, some, some lipids that are upregulated, um, some are uh, uh, significantly reduced which is not in a way um, not surprising because uh, some of especially this neutral lipid glycerolipids have been reported to be important for um, virus replication for autophagy and lipophagy which is energy source for uh, uh, for replication and forming those uh, vesicles um, and, and then we then formed a really uh, uh, this correlation map um, just to show that um, what is the relationship between the, uh, the different lipids in infected and uninfected cells. Then actually we start to see very, very interesting aspect, uh, which is that is mostly uh, around uh, sphingolipids. Sphingolipid seems to change uh, in, in, in a very different way as compared to the other. For example, the other lipids are most of them are upregulated or downregulated, but sphingolipid seems to have um, a distinct way of change within 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 a sphingolipid that actually attracts us our attention, and and um, and uh, and uh, we decided to follow up that observation. What I meant by that is that, for example, within if you look at the ceramide species. Some species of ceramides are upregulated as compared to down uh, the other the other lipids, especially um, short chain uh, 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 ceramide seems to um, uh, enrich as compared to uh, long chain ceramide. Um, so that is that is uh, what is depicted here. For example, the the ceramide eighteen sixteen acyl chain um, are more enriched as compared to the long chain um, uh, ceramide. 
So the question was why the sphingolipids have a role in um, Zika virus infection. Just to test this, I put this, this question, so what uh, we did was we tested, we treated um, Q7 cells uh, with uh, uh, muriosin and FEP1. Um, I don't think I need to describe the sphingolipid pathway for this crowd, but anyway, uh, Miriosin blocks serum palmitate transferase and uh, feminicin B1 blocks uh, ceramide synthase. So basically it means that, that uh, uh, for example, miriosin blocks the whole de novo pathway. Um, and, uh, and then you can um, measure the efficacy of this uh, uh, inhibitors by labeling your cells with um, uh, precursor for, in this case, uh, serine. Um, and as you can see, it's the level of sphingomyelin is completely blocked in both mediosin and FEB1 treated cells. Then what we did was uh, we infected uh, control and the inhibitor treated cells with, uh, uh, with Zika virus. And we collected the supernatant that is, uh, and measured the amount of virus that's produced by both uh, control and, uh, and the myriosin and FEP1 treated cells. And, uh, and then the, the, the result is uh, and, uh, quantified by plaque assay. Um, and uh, and, and, and uh, we found that myriosin and FEP1 treated cells have a very significantly reduced level of uh, virus and uh, in the, in the supernatant showing that uh, these lipids have a role in uh, the uh, Zika virus infection. You can also quantify the amount of uh, uh, virus you have in the supernatant by qPCR, just measuring the RNA of the virus. And the same is actually just look at the, uh, the amount of viral proteins inside the cells. By Western blot, you see the same uh, uh, trend that is a significant reduction of um, uh, Zika virus proteins in the and uh, in, in infected cells as compared to uninfected cells, showing that single lipids are critical for this process. Um, and uh, and then obviously, um, uh, you know, Zika virus in neurotropic that means it really primarily infect neuronal cells. So far, we used uh, hepatocyte Q7 cells. Uh, and to test uh, if this observation is also true in neuronal cells, what we used is we used the stem cells to drive uh, neuronal progenitor cells as a proxy for primary cells. Um, and what we did is, again, we treated the cells with myriosin and FEP1 uh, and infected with the virus. This, this uh, neuronal uh, progenitor cells are extremely permissive to the virus. They are very, very sensitive. But as soon as you treat them with meriosin or FB1, they become resistant. They don't really get infected at all. Or if they get just just, just a tiny bit. So, so um, and this is also the same in a neuronal uh, blast, a neuroblastoma cell lines, uh, confirming that these cells, these lipids are important in, in the relevant cell lines as well. So the next question was which step of Zika, uh, which step uh, of the life cycle, this, this lipids are important. Is that the entry at the very, very initial step uh, or replication uh, or uh, uh, maturation and release um, uh, of, of uh, the virus? Just because we just don't have time to go through all sorts of tests that we did. Basically, we, we followed the virus life cycle and we measured the, the, the the entry, replication, and the maturation of the cells. What, what we found, what we found with that, that is a, the, whether there is a sphingolipids or not, the entry is not affected. What is really significantly affected is that the replication, once the virus is inside the cells, uh, the replication is dependent uh, on uh, on, on, on a swing and, and the presence of single lipids. So this is, we measured the viral um, RNA, the replication of the RNA, the virus RNA at a different time point post-infection, because once it is entered, actually the replication 
you get a me measurable amount of RNA within four hours post-infection. If you just measure that, you, see, you get a really a significantly reduced amount of um, uh, virus as compared to the control, showing that single lipids block Zikvi replication. Then the, the, the next question was, which you know, species is that ceramide? Is that um, uh, sphingosin, one phosphate, the sphinganine, or, or sphingomyelin, or high-risk uh, glycosphingolipids that are important? For that, um, we happen to have a sphingomyelin synthase knockout cell line in the lab. So the first thing was uh, just to test to see if those knockout cell lines were um, uh, sensitive or resistant to uh, the, the, the virus. To our surprise, the knockout cells are, I have never seen a cell line that is sensitive to the virus. They start to get extremely, extremely sensitive to the virus. They start to pump out basically virus like crazy. So after repeating probably, I don't know, 10 times because it was just, uh, we, we, we somehow told us, uh, uh, it is artifact, but and, and and the interesting part is if you put back the 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 the, the enzyme, it become um, uh, restrictive to the virus, showing that elevated ceramide levels might involve um, enhance the replication. Okay, um, and then and, and just to complement the our uh, this and this is this observation, what we did was. Then we uh, used another way of enriching the level of ceramide in the cells. That is by using a sphingomyelinase inhibitor that um, uh, block the degradation of sphingomyelin. If you use, if you treat the cells with sphingomyelinase inhibitor, they become resistant. Uh, and if you exogenously add bacterial sphingomyelinase into the media, for example, they are again become more sensitive to the to the virus. This is uh, a non-structural for the the uh, we label the cells with um, uh, Zika virus non-structural proteins, and then also obviously we quantified the RNA the, and also performed the Black assay showing that it is, it is the same. Uh, just to summarize this part of the talk, uh, what we showed is that um, if you block, uh, if you treat the cells with myriosin or FB1, or if you have a genetic knockout for certain palmitate transferase, you get a significant reduction in the clear application. And uh, the sphingomyelin, uh, sphingomyelin uh, synthase knockout cells, they become extremely permissive to the virus. And if you use sphingomyelinase inhibitor, uh, you uh, re uh, again uh, enhance that, uh, which is consistent with the idea that ceramide is involved in this process. The next key aspect of our question was, which viral factor uh, is involved in this process? So this is the genome of uh, the, the genome of the, the, the this virus. As I've said, it is the, the nice part of lady viruses that they are very small. Uh, so that allows us really to test this hypothesis. They have three structural proteins and seven non-structural uh, proteins. Um, so what we did was that. Um, uh, by can we identify that is really responsible for in, uh, for for uh, inducing high level of ceramide uh, during infection? Because of uh, you know uh, we per, we did a lot of uh, literature research, research, which was um, uh, and then we decided a couple of lipidomic studies. Uh, what was uh, uh, I'm going to show you one. Um, uh, of our study that really uh, showed a significant change in ceramide and then, then affected the sphingolipid pathways uh, is that the nanostructure 4B um, uh, uh, was the one that really uh, uh, showed that. So what we did is, again, um, we transfected uh, cells with this uh, individual uh, protein and we performed the global lipidomics and they compared 
that with the virus infection. And this is the uh, lipid profiling. It is really, it's pretty much the, the it, it phonocopies the an infection. Um, and it, I mean, there is a slight difference. For example, um, cardiolipins are increased in this one, but in, 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 in Zika virus infected cells, they are not. Uh, but, but, but I think just to make things easier, what we did is we compared the lipid changes that are significantly affected by um, uh, NS4B and a Zika virus. The most significant one in this process are actually those of ceramides, which show that um, NS4B uh, is responsible for, at least uh, partly responsible for changing lipids during infection. And, and then the next question was, what is really the mechanism? Uh, uh, how exactly this NS4B uh, or Zika virus alters the, 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 the sphingolipid pathway? For that, we, we really performed a very careful analysis of um, uh, uh, just, j j just to look at the localization of um, the replication factory of the virus versus sphingolipids. This is just to show you that we, uh, th this is a um, high resolution microscopy of a virus, a Zika virus infected cells that were stained for ceramide and a non-structural 4B uh, protein that we know that it localizes at the replication uh, sites. So uh, these two uh, molecules actually co-localize nicely, as you can see on, the, uh, on, the, on, on, on this image, uh, indicating that uh, uh, ceramide um, Redistribute. Uh, usually, the, the 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 interesting part is if you just do normal staining on uninfected cells, you actually don't see this kind of. And then uh, this is just to show that um, ceramide is important uh, for for uh, infection. Okay, uh, and 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 then then it's redistribute and accumulate in the replication site. And uh, this is just a summary. Uh, slide showing that ceramide is important for replication uh, of uh, a Zika virus infection. Um, uh, and most of this is actually just uh, published in, in, in Nature Communications a few weeks ago. If you uh, want to learn more about this study, please uh, visit and read the paper. And with that, I would like to thank uh, the uh, members of our lab, mostly work by Hans, and uh, my collaborators, especially from Penn and Nell Washington, uh, that did the lipidomics, um, and, and also Ed Dennis from UCSC. Thank you for your attention.